consider other SQL statements at this point. Um, we've done the select. The one thing that I wanted to talk about with the select, but uh, we'll probably catch up on this later, is the use of aggregate functions. Can someone define what an aggregate function is in a select? I'll give a very quick example and then we'll move on. <coughs> an aggregate function. In SQL. What does the word aggregate mean? Combination. Yeah, it means means combining things, a combination, combining things. So an aggregate function is a function that works on a group of things, it combines things together. For example, if I wanted to count the number of students in the student table, all right? If I didn't care the names of the students or any information about any individual student, but I simply want to know how many students were in the student table, I could do this. Select count star from student. And that would just return one piece of information, and that is the, the number of students in the student table. All right? Um, there are several aggregate functions. Um, there is a count, which counts the number of students, so that would be the, you know, that would be, you know, a count of the number of students. There would, there is, um, a sum, and it doesn't really make sense for students, but if, for example, we were looking at an order and we wanted the total value of an order, we could say sum of cost, for example. We could say average, something like this. Select the average age from student, like that and that would return the average age for uh, all the students. If we want to break down those totals by some component, for example, we didn't want to simply know the total count of all the students, but we want to know the students broken down by state. We use the group by clause. And that would look something like this. Select state, count star, from student. Alright, and what that would do is that would give you a list of state, student, and number of students. So it would say Alabama, 5, Arkansas, 10, uh, Connecticut, 30, and so on down the line. All right. So it would show you a list of the states and the count of students by that. Yes? Could you say where state equals Ohio and just get the list with Ohio students? Well, if I said where list, well, if, if I said where state equals Ohio, I could. Oh, oh. First of all, there's a mistake here. I forgot the group by clause. Group by state. All right. And again, that will give me Alabama 5. <coughs> Arkansas, 10, and so on down the line. Now, if I said where state equals Ohio, yes, I could. And what that would do is that would just give me one number. It would show me Ohio, 35. And then there's no need for the group by, correct? No, there is a need for the group by. Okay. If we, if there is something in the select that is not an aggregate function, it must be in the group by. So if I wanted to break down by city and state, let's say, and I change this to say select city comma state count, I would need to change the group by to say city comma state. And then it would show me, you know, 
Amherst, Ohio, 5. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, 20. Elyria, Ohio, 18. And so on down the line. I hope we'll get an example of this, a uh, 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 more involved example of this uh, later on. But I did want to refresh your memory on the aggregate functions. This is one of those things that, that appear confusing to students, all right? When I grade uh, the sequel in a 143 class, this is one of the areas that seems to trip students up. The trick is to say that, first of all, you use aggregate functions when you're not interested in every row, but you just want to know some sort of totals. Totals, uh, sums, averages, counts, minimums, you know. I could say select min age from student, and it would tell me the age of the youngest student. Uh, maximum, select max from student, and it will tell me max's age. No, it will tell me the age of the maximum student, or the maximum age of the student. All right? So if you don't want to see the detail, but you just want to see some sort of totals, uh, use an aggregate function. Use a group by if you want those totals broken down by something. And what you're going to have is either, is that everything on the select is either going to be an aggregate function or included in the group by clause. If I said this, I would get an error because state is not included in the group by clause. <coughs> If you if I didn't have the group by at all, I would also get an error. Yes. Could you switch the two states? I could switch the two. Yes. And that would just uh, that would uh, change the order in which it was sorted. So, for example, if I said in fact state city is probably a better way to do it because then it would show all of the Alabamas broken down by city, all the Arkansas's, and so on down the line alphabetically. The other way I did it, it would show all the A cities, regardless of the state, all the B cities, regardless of the state, and all that. And that's probably not as good a way of organizing it. That's probably a better way. Now, one second. If I do the opposite, if I put something here and don't include it in the group by, it won't give me an error, but the results won't be meaningful. For example, there's a Cleveland, Mississippi, and a Cleveland, Ohio. If I just display the state and account, and I group by state and city, it's going to break it down by state, but it's not going to tell me what state is what. All right? So it will say Cleveland 5, Cleveland 6. So I don't know if Cleveland, Ohio has 5, or Cleveland, Mississippi has 5, or whatever. All right? I suppose I could guess based on alphabetical order, but you don't want to, you don't want to do that. Yes? Are, you going to, are we going to get into uh, inner joints and outer joints? Um, that's a great question. Um, we won't today, but that's a, that's a good thing to put on our list of things to, to talk about, the difference between an inner join and an outer join. Um, the basic joins that I've been doing in class have all been inner, or I'm sorry, have all been outer join, no. Um, they've all just been plain old joins where there has to be something on both ends. All right, but let's say, for example, if you join student table with the major table, and a student doesn't have a major table, with just a regular plain old join that I've been doing, that student wouldn't show up, and that's probably not a good thing. You want to show them up, and in which case you need to do an inner join. Um, again, we'll try to incorporate that into some some example at some point, and I'm going to make a note of that here. So I remember. All right. On to on to the SQL statements that allow you to actually change the data. These are actually in a, in a lot of ways simpler than the select statement, largely because. The select statement has a potential to uh, hit multiple tables, whereas 
the insert, update, and delete statements are all based on just one table. So that sort of from, from the word go makes these statements a little simpler. All right? So there's sort of less clauses associated with the, um, with the insert, update, and delete. However, probably more can go wrong. All right? And definitely, you can do more damage with these. Right? By querying, no matter what you query, you're not going to do any damage. Right? I might write a query that's incorrect, you know, and maybe it doesn't return any results, or maybe it returns results that I wasn't expecting or don't want, but at least it doesn't do anything to damage the data. All right? Or, you know, mo about the only error that you can get <coughs> with, with a query is that if you do the syntax wrong. All right? Or you get unexpected results. All right? Which in SQL's mind really isn't a error, right? If I do write a query and I don't do a join properly, I join the customer number with the manufacturer number, let's say, instead of customer number to customer number. From SQL's mind, it didn't make an error, right? It did what you told it to. You just need to get your, your act together, right? You just need to get your expectations straight and, and write, write the statement correct. So really about the only thing that could go wrong with the select statement is a syntax error. Whereas with inserts, updates, and deletes, a lot of things can go wrong, all right? And and plus, you can do more damage. So at some point, we're going to start talking about error catching and error trapping. All right? Um, because, again, it's more critical for these update um, statements. All right, let's look first at the delete statement. All right? And we'll talk about it, and then we'll talk about what can go wrong um, with the delete statement. All right. <coughs> Delete statements look like this. They're the simplest, and yes, they are the most dangerous. Delete from table, whatever that table is, where <coughs> something equals <coughs> some value. That would be sort of the generic form, assuming that something was a column that contains text. If it didn't contain text, then you would not need uh, the quotes around it. All right, let's talk about a specific example of a delete statement. Let's say we wanted to delete a student from the student table. <coughs> If we want to delete one specific student from the student table, and this will also apply to update statements, if we want to update one specific student from the student in the student table, we want to use a primary key in the WHERE clause. All right? We don't want to use name. We don't want to use anything else, right? Because if we use name, there's always a risk that there could be two people with that name, and we could delete two people instead of just deleting one. So, if you want to delete one specific member of an entity, you'll use a primary key. Likewise, if you want to update. Now, most, but not all, of our updates and deletes are going to be like that. All right? There are exceptions. We could, for example, create a web page that allowed me to transfer our customers to a different sales rep. Let's say... You know, a sales rep got promoted, so he's no longer going to be handling customers, all right? His replacement, we want to transfer all the other person's customers to the new sales rep, all right? In that case, we could write a page that did that very handily and, and transferred them over, and our update wouldn't be using the primary key of the customer table. It would be using some other field, all right? So we can write some sort of mass updates if we wanted to. However, for the most part, we're going to be dealing with updating or deleting individual rows, in which case, most of the time, we want to use the primary key. So, 
In our student example that we've been using over and over again, here would be an example of a delete. Delete from student where SID equals, no quotes because that's a number, five, let's say. Now, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory, you know. Gee, even if you didn't know SQL, it's probably pretty obvious what that's going to do. <coughs> that's going to delete from the student table those rows where the student ID equals five. It's going to take out the whole row. It'll take out the whole row, exactly. Deletes the whole row. Deletions are to delete an entire row, all right? Um, as opposed to, um, as opposed to like, let's say, uh, <coughs> change the, the faculty ID number of someone. So delete the faculty advisor off of a student. You don't delete the faculty advisor off of a student. You would change the faculty advisor to another value. You couldn't do this to, for multiple tables? Even you cannot, well, Good question. The question is, can you do it with multiple tables? No, with an asterisk next to it, <laughs> all right, with a, with a catch. You cannot have more than one table listed in a delete from clause, all right? That being said, a delete can delete from more than one table. What's the catch? I just said you can't have more than one table, and then the second later I said the delete could delete from more than one table. Cascade. Uh, the, and the catch is a cascading delete. For example, if there was information that was related to the student, yeah, and there was a foreign key for that, let's say there was a student phone number table. That's a good example. So maybe we have tables that look like this. We have a student table that has a student ID as a primary key, has the name, and so on. Then we have a student phone table. Now, and this would be a good normalized way to do it, right? Because a student could have a home phone, a mobile phone, a work phone number, and maybe some other phone numbers too, all right? So, we could develop a table that looked like this, student phone ID, that had a, uh, had a foreign key for student ID. And had the phone number and a description. If this was set to cascade delete, if I deleted the row in the student table, it would delete all the rows associated with that student in the student phone table. All right? Now, key thing to remember, the reverse isn't true. If I were to delete a student phone row, it would not delete the student, which makes sense, right? What's the whole purpose of cascading delete? The whole purpose of cascading delete is to not orphan a row in the table. So if this relates to that, all right, if this is this row's parent, all right, if I delete this, I can't leave rows in this table there by themselves. Yeah. Restrict delete. All right. The two 
main things that you have is you have cascade and <coughs> restrict. Other databases give another option, but at least you're going to have cascade and restrict. The idea of a cascade is if I delete the row in the parent table, will it delete the rows in the children's, the, the child table? And if it's set to cascade, it will. What if it's set to restrict? What if I set this relationship to restrict deletion in the student phone table? It, exactly. It would not let you delete the student if there were rows in the student phone table. Now let's think about that for a second. Is that something that makes sense in this particular case? Would I, uh, would I ever want to, you know, would I restrict deletion or, um, or uh, cascade deletion in this particular case? <coughs> I'd cascade it. Yeah, I'd cascade it because if the student is gone, it makes no sense for us to keep their phone numbers. All right. We have some visitors, by the way, that came in. That's what uh, a second ago uh, they were inadvertently sent to the wrong room. These are visitors from a, a school in France, and they're here to observe um, what we do. All right. Um, so good morning to everyone. Or, or wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, well, bonjour would be good day. Yeah, that one I know. I was trying to think of good morning. Bon matin? Bonjour. Bonjour? Okay, all right. So I had, I had two years of high school French, so I can, that means I can say five things, all right? So, uh, yeah, well, I, uh, boy, I, I can't even say, I can't say that I can say five things, so I'm in bad shape. Uh, at any rate, uh, and what school are you from? So many. Okay. And what, what, what are you studying? What were your courses of study? Business. Okay, business? Okay. Uh, well, it's good to have you here. Um, this class is a web uh, database class. So we talk about uh, database interactivity and, and, and putting stuff on websites. Right now, we're learning how to delete stuff from a database. Okay. All right? Okay. So in this particular case, if we had two tables, one for student and one for student phone number, it doesn't make any sense for us to keep the phone numbers if we want to get rid of the student. Repeat, please. You'd have orphan data floating Well, data. well, again, no, we wouldn't, because the only two options are to cascade or delete, or, or or restrict rather. So either when we delete the student, would delete all the phone numbers associated with that student, or it wouldn't let you delete the student. That's the beauty of relational databases. All right, if they're defined correctly, it won't let you have data that violates the referential integrity. Um. Now, this is a pretty obvious case, right? Because it doesn't make sense that we would want to keep a student's phone numbers if the, the student wasn't there. In uh, um, student phone number is, would be called, uh, this table would be called in database terms a weak entity, all right? What does it mean to say it's a weak entity? It means it, it depends on this table. If that row isn't there, then these rows don't make any sense, all right? And therefore, typically with weak entities, you want to cascade, all right? Now, what's the difference of a weak entity? A strong entity, all right? What would be an example of a strong entity? Well, let's go back to the example where we have, where we switch the roles, and we talk about a faculty table <coughs> which maybe has a faculty ID in it as a primary key and has a faculty member's name and other information. And then in the student table, we have a student ID, the student name, and we have a foreign key for the faculty ID, all right, so that each student has a faculty advisor associated with them. Now, in this particular case, would we want to cascade delete? So, right, if we deleted the faculty member, would we want to delete the students that are associated? No, right? It doesn't make sense to say, well, if this faculty member retires, all the students that they advise have to drop out of school. 
Right? It doesn't make any sense to, to do it that way. In database terms, that's because a student is what is called a strong entity. Right? A student has a life on its own. All right? We're still interested in the student data even if that relationship goes away and that faculty member uh, is deleted. All right? So in this case, student is a strong entity, so we would not cascade delete. We would restrict deletions. What does that mean? That means we would not be able to delete a faculty member as long as there were students that that faculty member advised. So, if we would try to do this, delete from faculty where FID equals 523, let's say. If faculty member 523 had some students that they advised, that statement would fail and we would get an error. Okay? Yes? So you'd have to update all of those right. files first, then delete? Yeah. And what you could do is you could do this through the user interface, right? Um, you wouldn't necessarily have to go through and manually change each student. For example, if you wanted to write a real slick interface, if you tried to delete a faculty member, it would run out and look to see are there any students associated with them. If there were students associated with that faculty member, it could pop up a window that would say, what do you want to do to this student? Do you want to, you know, do you want to transfer it to the student? Do you want to, you know, do you want to transfer to another faculty member? Do you want to, um, whatever, for that student? So you could handle it through the user interface to make it seamless, all right? But remember, on the database level, you want to restrict deletion, all right, in this case so that the database doesn't allow a student with a faculty member that doesn't point to an actual faculty member. So yeah, through the user interface you could write a little transfer program to transfer all those students or whatever, but on a database level you would prohibit that. Can you do like a mass uh, change, modify? Exactly. And what that would look like, this is a little bit ahead of that, but ultimately we could do something like this. Let's say if I win the lottery and retire, and all the students that I advise are transferred to NORAD, let's say. And let's say my number is 523 and his number is 111. We could actually write an update statement that would say, update student set faculty ID to 111, where faculty ID equals 523. Now this would be one of those rare cases that I said before where I said usually the where clause is going to be the primary key. This would be a rare case where it's not the primary key, it's something else. All right. So yeah, now we wouldn't just have a statement like this in our program. Right, because we don't want to. Every time someone retires, they get transferred to NORAD. Right, that that wouldn't make sense. But what we could have is we could have a user interface where they could select the professor that they get assigned to, and then you could click the button, and then it would go ahead and execute a statement that looks like this. And then we, you could go back and delete to that faculty. And then you could delete it. In fact, you could have it all in one action. You click that button. First, it does the update. Then it goes and does the deletion after you've assured that the deletion, or I'm sorry, after you've assured that you've, you, you've removed everyone associated with that faculty member. So, deletions can fail if there is a foreign key uh, constraint, due to foreign key constraints. And again, foreign key constraints either can be to update, I'm sorry, either to cascade, or to restrict. All right? Now, Keep in mind a couple things. First of all, a delete statement will either completely succeed or completely fail. All right? A delete statement won't halfway delete something. Let me give you an example. 